just gonna fuck shit off the windowsills. Yeah, security van. I'll edit that out of the video. <laughs> no. Um, so I'm, I am recording it just so that we can have some archive material because. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, should we crack on? Kate's got to get to a ladies' night, ladies' day. What's that about? Okay, we'll go fast. Twelve thirty. Okay, we should be able to fly through. Look, I can stay, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if it's boring you, if you already know it, and, and um, <laughs> this is. Now, you leave, it means you're bored. Yeah, quite. Well, you already know it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's trouble. So, first, thanks heaps for your time this Arvo. It's a you know, precious Saturday afternoon of family and stuff like that. Um, and uh, thanks for really being interested in developing your skills as functional movement therapist. Uh, I think having a, a bit more awareness of the clinical aspects of what we do is super important because you remember we we are primarily a clinical program um, and that's probably an area of your knowledge that we can keep building on yeah fantastic movement coaches but it's really nice to know a bit more fundamentally or have more knowledge on the fundamentals of why you're doing what you're doing and also i just have to say that you know every patient that i see who comes through our program um, they, they absolutely love the work that you guys are doing so uh, it's just a nice opportunity to be able to say that to you guys um, that, uh, that I'm ex exceedingly uh, happy and proud of what you guys are doing for us it's really cool we love you um, so we'll, we're going to touch on a bit of uh, anatomy, physiology, biomechanics, a bit of pharmacology um, and of course uh, a bit of the surgery and because we're doing a, a bit of a lot of work with um, Toby Cohen, the thoracic outlet syndrome and the popliteal artery syndrome. So what do you think of the three pictures up there, Courtney? What, what would you what would you feel about the movements, the positions that I've got um, up there now? Any any thoughts on those three positions? With the uh, yeah. Um. <laughs> Is any one of those positions um, bad, good, uh, indifferent uh, in terms of? If they're doing it repetitively day in day out, mm -hmm. uh, obviously the middle one's a flex position there with the spine, so mm -hmm. it's more mm -hmm. neutral spine. Yep. Um. So you'd be a little bit more cons. Out of those positions, which which position would you be most concerned about? The middle one. Yep. Um, and uh, what about the uh, what about the left hand side? Uh, still maintaining neutral spine. Yep. So. So would he would he be fulfilling our um, our neurohab movement points of performance? Uh, so. terms of, uh, I mean. Or if we, if, we, if we think about hip centric rotation, posterior chain activation, neutral spine position, unloaded knees, proficiency limited range of motion, I'd probably give them all a tick. Like I say, so he, and, and, and obviously we don't, we don't teach our patients to move like that because what that really shows us is that he has a very high functional capacity that he's able to apply those neurohab movement points of performance and also um, I still and the, 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 the front squats the front squats a nice front squat and it's it's most definitely um, uh, things that we would teach our patients the the middle one what what do you think about the fact that if if he just stood up and walked off quite happy what what does that tell us because that obviously doesn't fulfil neurohab movement points of performance, um, namely because he is in a non-neutral position. Um, and what, why do you think he's able to then just say, okay, photo's taken, off I go? Uh, anyone can chime, anyone chime in. If, you know, just, if, yeah. 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 yeah, exactly right. Yeah. And... I don't know whether you guys have thought much about this concept of micro motion, micro motion uh, in relation to the the motion segments of the vertebrae, and um, well, I might just talk a little bit about that. What's that? The top picture. Yeah. What was the picture doing? 
which topics are you talking about? Oh, the one that I rubbed off. It was for a patient who had a uh, um, very tight posterior chain. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if we think about micromotion, we can, we can have a vertebral body. So just think about the spine as being a whole heap of joints, no different to a knee joint or an elbow joint or a shoulder joint. It's just that they're, they're, they're just all stacked on top of each other. So if we say that's four, five, L4, five, um, motion that we want to avoid to prevent injury is this sort of translational type of um, translational type of movement where the, the vertebral bodies are putting a lot of tension. It doesn't have to be a, it doesn't have to be under massive load, it can be quite trivial. And I'm sure you've heard lots of our patients say that they've just hurt themselves tying their shoelace, not not lit, not picking up cement bags or doing heavy things and we'll often have um, uh, labourers, you know, miners, uh, in a work cover, you know, big burly guys who have been lifting or digging or, or doing bricklaying all day and then they hurt themselves when they go to pick up their lunchbox. So it doesn't take a lot of force to injure these structures and say this, this is the type of movement that we want to avoid. Okay, um, and you can still be in a, a rounded, rounded position like that and not, and not develop. So imagine there's our spine there and we've got our, our, our vertebral bodies there and between our vertebral bodies are the discs. Okay, so if we've got the functional capacity to maintain that rounding, there's very little micro motion. There's very little micro motion between each each segment, and so therefore we can do hollow holes and hollow rocks and do that type of thing, or burpees, and 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 not actually feel any injury at all. But with our patients, the the problem with them is that when they try to, if they're not told that moving in neutral position is the ideal movement pattern, then they will start to do trivial things around the house and they're not, they don't have the capacity to maintain that nice smooth controlled spinal movement and this is where we start talking about micro instability okay so that one bone slips slightly more forward than the other or sometimes the bone may even slip backwards and and then we get what's called retrolisthesis and we're talking fractions of millimeters where over repetitive um, accumulative mechanical stress we develop this micro instability micro instability and that can then um, manifest with wow I just bent forward to pat the cat and dog on the head and I had this massive spasm and I just dropped to the ground because that's the moment where this accumulative micro instability ends up in a definitive tear of the structures and then that's when your body goes bang um, now I'm going to fire these nociceptive signals to your brain so um, just have a yeah, be, be happy that you understand that instability is not sometimes we might not be able to see instability with ours it's, it's just micro micro instability and and hence when people um, like they might be on the on the gym floor and they go oh look but it's fine I'm fine okay so you just know that at that point he's moving uh, with enough capacity to maintain uh, or minimize micro instability so nothing's really happened and also there be, there's an accumulative factor as well it may not happen like in a young person you know some of our young athletes it, it may not happen uh, straight away it's, it's, it's similar to similar to many other insults that we we introduce into our body like smoking cigarettes we can smoke 20 cigarettes a day for, for 10, 15 years and be absolutely fine. But then suddenly one day we cough up blood and we get a diagnosis of lung cancer. So this, these poor movements uh, we, we most definitely don't advocate because um, the accumulative effect that they have on the stability of the spinal integrity. Okay. So 
Does that make sense? Have we, we haven't really talked too much about micro-instability before, but that's sort of at the root cause of it, at, at, at the heart of what we're trying to prevent um, in terms of movement dysfunctions effect on the spinal integrity. Um, and the, the, um, the functional capacity is what protects you. That's what protects all of us when we, when we do um, movements that aren't in neutral position. Okay, so the, the functional capacity is the ultimate metric that protects us from, you know, uh, poor movements too. Okay, nice opening slide, try to go a bit faster. Um, primary purpose of the musculoskeletal system. Sammy, what do you think? What, the yellow one? What's primary the... Purpose. Yeah, what do you... To move. Yep. Yep. Any other, any other additions to that? Huh? Support. Support. Yep. <coughs> and maybe protection. Protection. Protection of our organs. Yeah. Okay. So by definition, um, uh, if if the if the primary purpose of the musculoskeletal system is movement, then if we have a if we have a failure of that system, then it has to be a movement dysfunction. Okay, so um, it, it really it, uh, it surprises me that so many people consider musculoskeletal system injuries, whether it's your knee, your elbow, your hip, your shoulder, to not be related to movement. Because the, the primary function of having a musculoskeletal system, ligaments, joints, tendons, muscles, like all of those structures have a sole purpose to allow us to move. They do provide support, they do provide um, protection to our organs, but only so that we can then move. Because if we didn't move, we really wouldn't need to have that protection for our bodies. We wouldn't need support if we, if we weren't uh, moving a lot. So, so if there is a problem with the musculoskeletal system, then by definition, the system failure is a movement dysfunction. It's a, it's a failure of movement. And then in blue, uh, that's what I boil down. I, I synthesise the difference between our program or any any functional program, uh, whether it's Neurohab or uh, some other service that's delivering a, a functional therapy, is that we are transferring skills to our to our patients, our, our customers, our clients, um, and and that's why when people talk to me and the first thing they say yes yes we do we do functional movement and they they then reflexly mention gray cook's book yeah. which is the um the fms system and that completely undermines what they're saying to me because we we don't we don't use Gray Cook's book at all in our program because it, it's going back towards quantitative measurements of, of movement, not uh, qualitative uh, assessment of movement. The, I don't know whether you've looked at FMS. Have you looked at FMS? Yeah. yeah. It's all about measurements and range of motion and, and um, uh, can I get into certain positions, but it's not about how I move qualitatively, it's, and, and a lot of the um, a lot of the physical therapy industry is is measuring range of motion and um, angles that people can ob obtain with their movement, and that's not really what is relevant when we're trying to transfer skills to people. And so, the definition of what we're doing and the definition of a functional program is that we're transferring skills to people, and you've had ten. You know, hundreds of people stand in front of you telling you what they've been doing for many, many years, and really, not one of those people have said in their descriptions of their their rehabilitation have said anything remotely like skill acquisition. Okay, and 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 hence we have the the coach's eye is one of the most important things that um, that we can own uh, as as movement therapists. The coach's eye. And the coach's eye does is not. I could get anyone off the street to do an F F FMS screen. You can learn the FMS screen from a book, and then get a client in and say, "Okay, put your foot on this ruler, and take a step." 
and is that a very narrow step or is that a broad step or do a squat and is that a full range squat and just get the ruler out and measure it and you don't need a coach's eye for that there's no coach's eye that's just 100 percent quantitative so we've had lots of people get in contact with us and talk talk to us about the the gray cook and i said I, I i diplomatic but it's it's not movement therapy it's not functional therapy all right so um i think i might have already touched on that the that movement is qualitative and structure um, is quantitative uh, and we're all about that uh, the the qualitative aspects of of movement we don't ignore the the anatomical stuff and and that's that's very relevant for us to know about but that's that's what we'd be referring to if we were um, non-functional therapists we'd be we'd be worrying about f flexibility range of motion strength and the shape of our the shape of our joints as opposed to the the quality of movement that's, that the coach's eyes is um, responsible for assessing okay so I don't know where you saw that I just put that on Facebook the other day I was just sitting there and I thought wow this is every single every single injury that I see um, whether it's in the neck in the lumbar spine in the um, uh, patients who describe knee issues you know the um, the 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 uh, thoracic outlet and the popliteal syndrome everything has to start out with a functional deficit so every structural deficit. I was explaining to this to the patient the other day that his his little structural injury which is clearly evident there and extremely painful uh, uh, during the evolution of it um, didn't just happen it wasn't just it didn't just pop out of the blue um, and, and and start to cause him symptoms something had to cause it and it had to be it had to be it had to commence or originate as a as a functional deficit okay so we'll we'll just have a little bit of a chat about bones um, and the spine itself so this is more this is moving a, a little bit away from the the functional elements but um, when we talk about the anatomy of the spine we, we break it up into segments so we have our uh, cervical spine okay I'm sure you guys are pretty familiar S seven vertebrae uh, that make up the cervical spine and then our thoracic spine and our lumbar spine so the thoracic spine has 12 vertebrae lumbar spine five in between all of the vertebrae we have the discs and also notice oh, Oh, what's yeah. happened there? Hmm. No, no, it's like it's just, just the, um, the computer. That's working. How's that? Okay, cool. So we've got the, the curves. So, um, Joe, what about the, the curves? What do we, how do we refer to the curves of the spine? Lordosis, yep, yep, and and we can see we can see here cervical lordosis, thoracic kyphosis, and uh, lumbar lordosis, um, and that position, the, the position, everyone's going to be a little bit in, individual and and and, um, and different, but we're we're aiming for people to find their neutral position and when we say their neutral position that's the position of the spine that, that that puts least mechanical stress on the spinal integrity if we can do heaps of work in uh, in neutral position we're minimizing mechanical stress on the motion segments and if we minimize mechanical stress we minimize biological inflammation and we minimize structural breakdown George um, can I get you guys just to clarify when we um because we in our neutral spine talk we do bring that up. Mm. Um, I remember Joe saying something once about not really wanting us to say that everybody's spine is different. Yeah, only in the context yeah. of it can be interpreted that the reason why they can't maintain three points of performance and stuff is because their spine is different. And everyone has yeah. the potential to over time unless you've got some bad scoliosis or something. Yeah. And so it can I think it can be misinterpreted that their difference the reason why they can't. It's that because they come in here already probably thinking that they're 
they're different. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so just being careful on how we word it. Well, a lot so of... How do we say that without saying that? Okay, um, uh, like... Uh, it would be unusual for us to all be in perfect neutral position. Okay, like we would have small deviations if we x-rayed our spines and we could have a little bit of scoliosis and, and a bit of lateral deviation, maybe a bit more lordosis than someone else. Um, but th that, is, that is the optimised position for our body and the principles of what we're trying to achieve in everyone are the same. So we, 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 want, to, we want to achieve positions that minimise the the mechanical stress on our body. So the fact that we've got a patient um, coming to see us with pain immediately tells us that the position that they're in, in that, they, that they are in, is not optimised. Okay, so, so I, I might have a slight lateral deviation, but if I don't suffer pain, if I don't suffer disability, and I've optimised the movement for that that congenital whatever it may be then I've optimized my neutral position it may not be neutral it may not be biomechanically neutral compared to yours but your neutral position is optimized for you I think you can say that we're, we're slightly we're all slightly different yeah, yeah. Um, I just want to you mentioned that yeah. we're saying it's yeah. Yeah, still so use the word neutral, yeah. still use the word neutral. Yeah. Um, it, it's like you're, I'm a bit taller than you, and, and, um, but for your body, that's the height that you want to be at. I don't stretch you out to make you the same height as me. And likewise with someone's spine, I don't change the, the curvature here uh, to make it match some, some arbitrary you know, 20 degrees or 30 degrees of lordosis. I want to optimise the positions for their body, and but if they, if we can see that they're getting, if we can see that they're acquiring structural deficits and suffer pain and disability, it means that they're not optimised to the to the level that they could be, which is what our job is to do. Um, and and so sometimes we will see, like you know, there's patients that we all know um, that have super hyperlordosis. Um, and if they are no longer in pain and, and, and are having a high functional capacity and no longer disabled, then we can, we can sort of accept that. We can accept that. So they've now, they've now modified their movement with, with our input to optimise the neutral position of their spine that minimises their symptoms. Like yeah, there's, there's lots of, yeah. There's lo and I mean, ideally we would, I'd like to see people um, looking like bones but we we, we can't we, it's impossible it's impossible for us to, to achieve question, that. No, it's that everyone's a little bit different but we're looking for the optimal position to yeah. yeah okay so you just wanted to clarify yes. like yeah. when we're um <laughs> yeah so that uh, i think um but you you'll see you'll you'll see people who who hyperlordose so like last night i was working with someone doing the overhead squats and um he was ex extremely hyperlordotic and um we could make him we could still make him better okay, so so there's there's areas there that we could work on to make him less hyperlordotic he wasn't we don't stable in that position yeah yeah we don't turn around and we can see him struggling and struggling we we don't say well he, that's his that's just how he is well not really because we can see a lot of deficits that are correctable and um so once say we we eliminate those uh, deficits um and we see him do an overhead squat he'll he'll do it better he may not be as good as sam's or it may not be as good as yours but it'll be optimized for him yeah. if you can't see any deficits that you, can, that you can correct then then we're now uh we've reached the maximum input that we can deliver as movement therapists all right cool okay there's a what do you <laughs> what do you think about the um the, the the structure of our what I'm getting to is the center of gravity of our body. So if you look at if you look at the spine, there's our, our cervical spine, thoracic spine, lumbar spine, pelvis. If you just thinking about why lumbar issues are so prevalent in in modern industrialized society, if you look at where the center of mass is, we've got a center of mass here in our head. We've got a, a massive centre of mass here in our torso and then we've got the remaining centre of mass here in our, in our hips or pelvis. 
So really you've got exposure here and here that, that really needs a high level of functional capacity to maintain. It's, it's almost like saying here's, here's a chopstick here's a chopstick and put a put a, um, a brick on the on the top of the chopstick and a brick on the bottom of the chopstick and good luck to what happens here because that's a, that's a, essentially how our body has become uh, biomechanically when we chose to become bipedal okay if you if you agree with evolution science uh, which is it's pretty clearly evident to me when you look at you know our ancestral tree is that we have gone from quadruped position to bipedal position and now we've got this massive load up here and this massive load down the bottom and this tiny little spine segment of five bones that is subject to the these new forces of the upright position so the upright position has has created the the uh, has has made us susceptible to movement dysfunction whereas when we were quadrupeds the the forces are no nowhere near um, uh, as likely to create the the structural deficits that arise if if we um, uh, had a little bit of movement dysfunction so neuro evolve we go back to quadrupeds yeah yeah well i think um, and how many? <laughs> how many times have you seen me have to do a discectomy in the thoracic spine? Mm. Hardly ever. Like the 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 the, the textbook prevalence is about one in a million. And why why um, why do you think that I don't? Why do you think that we don't see thoracic disc prolapse very often at all? It's only it's only here. To here, and why is there no disc prolapses? Whereas we get, you know, five disc prolapses a week so down here. More in the center of mass. Less movement. Yep. Well. well, if you think about the motion, like you look at the spine, you know, we, these joints, oops, these joints are very much lending themselves to motion. Mm -hmm. So they, these, these guys slide on top of each other. So. We, we have a lot of motion in the thoracic spine, um, so why don't we get disc prolapses there? Is it also to do with sitting? The amount that we're sitting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, think, think fundamentally, what, what, is it, what is it that protects us when we are doing heavy deadlifts? Our capacity, oh. our functional capacity, okay. our functional capacity protects us. And if you think about the shape of the the thoracic spine, what what is what is wrapped around the thoracic spine that's different to the lumbar and the neck? The, ribs. the rib cage. Mm. Exactly. We've got this this series of twelve bones that are all linked around our torso, that and with muscles in between them, that creates this immediate functional capacity superior to the neck we have a low functional capacity and in the lumbar spine we have an even lower functional capacity in the lumbar spine it's really low in the neck it's a little bit it's not quite as low because the head is much lighter than the torso and so you you don't have this this susceptibility whereas down here we've got this whole torso and head just rocking and rolling on this pole and so to keep this healthy we have to maintain a high functional capacity and to keep a high fun functional capacity we have to move well whereas in the ribs we can twist and we can do all sorts of roly polies and the functional capacity is inherently greater and hence it's a one in a million disc prolapse uh, incidence um, in the thoracic spine because anatomically we are just gifted with greater functional capacity in the thoracic spine and so hence most of our work is in the neck and in the lumbar spine right. um, i'm sure you guys are pretty familiar with all of the muscles the um the important thing to see to, to recognize here is that the uh the the cluster of muscles that that provide support for our, our spine are, are broken up into lots of different um, anatomical positions and, and a lot of the muscles are very small and when we don't move well it's very easy to disengage the smaller muscles 
and, and then we start to um, develop dysfunctional movement where the big muscles do all the work and the small muscles can't catch up and hence why we do a lot of those accessory, accessory um, drills that is, that is part of developing functional capacity. But before we can even think about doing that, we have to develop the motor patterns, the central nervous system element of movement. And then once we've got that nailed down, we then start doing all the other stuff, you know, all, all of our, um, uh, yeah, all the farmers carry the waiters walks, but, but we've, got to get, we've got to get hip hinging uh, down pat first. Yeah. But yeah, you can see that it's, it's so intricate, the muscles, and, and around the shoulder in particular, where we get all those rotator cuff and, and issues. Um, why, why does core strengthening not improve back pain? It's not suppressing how we move. Yep, that's pretty much it. Yet, um, uh, the, the, the default instruction to people with back pain is to strengthen their core. So we can, have, we can have extremely strong muscles here and we see lots of people with athletes with super strong muscles but yet they still have back pain because... Yeah, focusing on like the stability because they said exactly what you just said. Um, yeah. Stabilizing yeah. muscles. Yeah, muscles it's so them. easy. It's so easy we to fall into that trap. Pattern. Yeah, they're, they're super strong but they're not coordinated. Yeah. So we want, we want, really what we want is a coordinated core. Yeah. It's not just core strengthening, it's a coordinated core. And, 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 and that's what we're, we're training. We're developing a coordinated core. And the core, the core will develop naturally with the coordination. Um, but just focusing on core is, is pretty, pretty futile. When would, would we need to strengthen someone's core? Kate, when do you think we should do core strengthening for our patients? After they've got their movement efficiency. Yep, okay. And that would be to enable them to... So just say so you got their movement proficiency. Yep, they've done the eight weeks and um, they're happy. Kate, my back's awesome. Yep. When would you say you've got to strengthen your core? What would, if they... What would be the indicate? Like, what would be the indication then to to say, oh, you know, you better you better do some core strengthening as well. In terms of just skill acquisition. Yeah, in terms of just building. getting them to be able to do more stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Building, building function. Yeah. 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 So if you got rid of their pain, you got rid of their pain with the motor pattern training, the neurohab, and then said, Kate, my pain's gone. I want to now, I want to now do stand up paddle boarding from Maroochydore to you know Grey Woman Island or whatever it is. You're going to then go, ooh, have you got the capacity to do that? If you want to, do, if you want to do that, you're going to, you're going to have to do some core strength. Okay, that then builds your, your capacity. And the only other situation is if people are so weak that their strength does not allow you to progress them with their motor movement proficiency. So there are some patients, like you know, little old grannies that I've seen in in clinic, and I say, nah, you're not ready. You can't do neurohab because because the moment you guys try to get them to do a hip hinge they're just so weak uh, they just can't do it so what what i do then is that's when i do send people to exercise physiologists and i send them to physios with very specific instructors do some core strengthening send them back to me in two months time because I, I know they're not going to get movement therapy have we had patients do that that have come to europe mm. um Possibly if you would have snuck through, but there's a lot that I that there's a lot that I screen out, and that's the thing. If you if you see someone in, in on the floor who's exceedingly weak and they just can't hold themselves up and maintain the new like it doesn't take much. Like, your, your core sort of develops in accordance with your daily life activities. So if little old grandma is getting out of bed and, and walking downstairs and making herself a cup of tea, her, her core will develop so that she can do that. Um, but if, if she does those tasks like this, and, and her core is only going to develop as good as it, it, it can be to do that. And you come along as a neurohab therapist and go, hey, stand up, tall little grandma, and she doesn't have the strength to do that. You're never going to succeed as a movement therapist. So what we would then need to do is say, Dave, this person's got such weak core that I can't get her to do good hip hinges. We've got one with, coming in. So 
Oh, the one that you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. She's one that doesn't pass being in a group situation because she's so deep in Yeah. yeah. Um, and, I, and my job is to try to filter those guys out before you get to them. Occasionally I, I, I make a bit of a mess. We had one lady that came in on a walker. Mm. Who was that? She did some one-on-ones with Luke and then she came back and she was like, do you remember her? Yeah. Could you, could you open that door? Button? And then by the end of it, is she, it Eki, is the Eki on? She didn't have the walker in. Is there an Eki yeah. button? Yeah. Joey? Is there an air conditioner button? Not for you. It's on, I think. It is on? It's pretty sure. Is that the okay. stuff? Yeah. But does that... Does that does that make sense when, when we talk about core? Like, we, we, we rarely talk to patients about core during the neurohab, but um, if someone brings up core, that's really where we direct it towards. And um, you'll be, you'll, most, most patients you'll know immediately that their core is adequate to do neurohab. Um, it's pretty uncommon. Are you seeing a lot of um, overweight patients or patients that have been overweight that have no discomfort, mm. that they have no coordination? Mm, 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 mm. Core. It's like their shoulders are here, yeah. their hips are here, yeah. and in between it's just yeah, yeah, yeah. like John, yeah. 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 Jonathan. Yeah. A lot of this yeah. Marcus. Marcus is Marcus a really is good a really example good of that. Yeah. He's been really overweight. When you're making him do things that are high demand, so wall walks and things like that, you can see the core. Oh, yeah. You can oh, see right. the core is not there. The yeah. Okay. So lower limbs, you know all those muscle groups, but you can, you know, just in case you had, weren't aware, quadriceps made up of uh, four different uh, muscle fascicles. The hammies are really referred to as biceps femoris, semitendinosa, semimembranosa. So there's three, three little um, uh, stri uh, strips of muscle tissue there. And the glutes. Um, there's a lot of other musculoskeletal soft tissues, right? So tendons, ligaments, cartilage, labrum, joint capsules, um, menisci. Um, they can get injured as well. And um, how do they get injured? Like, why, why do we get tendonitis? Why do we, why do we get um, uh, enthesitis or uh, uh, pain around our, um, our cartilage? There's two ways. You're either going to be moving dysfunctionally or exceeding your capacity. So like if we, do, if we did MRF two times a day and we did it with perfect form, we're still going to get tendonitis. We're still going to cop an injury. Um, or if we try to do 10 to 15 unbroken muscle ups, I can guarantee you that most people, their last couple of reps is going to be dysfunctional. The first 10 are fine, bang, bang, no, no injury at all. As we fatigue and we start to move poorly and we chicken wing and we're, you know, we're not in good position, that can also create injuries to these structures here. That's what you saw at the, was it regionals? Mm. The programming was very shoulder mm. heavy. Was that the dip? Uh, but there was a couple in a row that were really shoulder heavy and they had all of the these injuries. Blew out the pecs or whatever? Yeah, yeah. pec injuries, that's right. Um, Just yeah. overloading. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. So, so it, it even even people who have proficient movement can still develop injuries. We can all get tendonitis and, and Achilles and um, uh, you know the common flexors and things like that is very common in, with with our athletes who you look at them and they're moving fantastically, but it means that they are just exceeding their their boundary. And and I sort of try to explain this graphically by saying that. Say, say, this is what, say this is a new athlete, okay, let's say this is Jordan, okay, let's say this is Jordan, and, and he's, he's, he needs to train within this boundary, okay, As like, if, he, if he steps out of this boundary and tries to do 15 total bars, he's going to get a labral tear, um, but if he, if he then stays within this boundary for a month and does his 5 total bar, and has a rest and does another five total bar and has a rest and then another, another, another five total bar. Within a month, that's his new boundary. Okay, so his boundary is now increased. So this is his functional capacity boundary. And then he now trains and he can do 10 total bar unbroken. He can do 10 total bar, just keeps doing it. He's not getting an injury because he's staying within his cut. But in three months' time, his boundary's out here. So as long as we stay inside this, this, this fence line, um, we're safe. It doesn't mean that we're not getting a greater functional capacity because the boundary line is always changing as we continue to train within this boundary. 
and, and the biggest mistake that athletes make is that they start training outside here to get accelerated gains and all that does is create this type of situation where they'll get injuries and then all of a sudden the boundary line changes. Oh, that was nice. right. <laughs> yeah. But, but that, that, I, I think that is, this is, this is, this is Matt Fraser, okay, Matt Fraser can always, he's always staying within his boundary line and so it's not like he's not progressing as an athlete, it's just that his, it's just that his boundary line is just getting huge, he's got acreage. Okay, we've all got 400 metre city blocks, whereas Matt Fraser's got acreage. He's still staying within his boundaries though, and so he doesn't get injured. And so he never has setbacks, uh, which is completely different to other athletes. Same with things like bursitis. Yeah, bursitis. And like tendonitis. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of, like you said, Jordan, like he's always been doing the same thing. And he does them in 10 sets of five and he comes up fine. Yeah. As opposed to doing trying 25. Yeah. yeah. No, it's yeah. totally fine. It's not the total volume that he's putting. Well, he hasn't adapted to it. Yeah, well, it. I think that does, definitely. Uh, it's like if I had to do, if I had to do muscle ups, I'd break them up into threes or twos or they'd slowly decline as I got through my work. I'm still doing the same amount of work but I'm breaking up the amount of work so that I can maintain uh, proficiency. Okay, if I try to go too fast and, and I start to develop dysfunction, then I, I will get a label, and you know, you know what I've been like for the last year with bloody shoulder issues. Um, but that's start, because I've started to think about that, it's now starting to repair automatically. I don't have to do it, I don't have to go and get surgery or like that. So with, with Jordan, it wouldn't be the volume, it would be his movement. Mm. And so if you break him down the movement, so he has to have more breaks, so that he's forced to reset his movement. If he then resets the movement, but he can't, he's he's lost his movement efficiency, then you would have to reduce his reps. Yeah, because having, having a break, yeah, yeah. having a break very temporarily pushes your capacity up again, because your muscles are working, yeah. you just have a 10 second break or 5 second break, immediately your, your physiology lets your muscles get strong again, pull them to another 3. But it gets to the point where you do fatigue, yeah. that's what I think you're saying, that the volume side of it, yeah, it's more if he's not moving, yeah. so you can't activate someone. his shoulders anymore. Yeah. Hanging, then when I'm looking at people with injuries and helping them come back, I'm looking at the volume they've done and I'm progressing it once yeah. a week. Exactly. A week. You're trying to keep so them. You you're trying to keep them in that. In that boundary. In that little zone. Um, but that's where we, you know, even if your athlete is moving perfectly uh, and 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 doing these airs, you you can still get. Uh, injuries if you're pushing them beyond their, their boundary. Mm -hmm. yeah, cool. Alright, so soft tissue, enthesitis. Do you know what enthesitis means? That's right where the tendon logs into the bone. Okay, as opposed to tendonitis um, here, which is in the fleshy part of the tendon. Where the tendon comes in and lands on the bone is typically a much more significant injury because there's, there's a less blood flow uh, around that insertion point to promote healing. And enthesitis can take ages to heal. Bursitis, I didn't spell that, spell Where that wrong. Where is that most common, like knee um, for, for us, Achilles, um, is it the, the, the tendon, the, like golfer's elbow, tennis elbow. Yeah. yeah. But is it just broadly described as tendonitis? Well, tendonitis. Yeah, you might. You might. People are just. I've got. I've got tendonitis. Yeah, but. Yeah, they won't say endosite. Just so that you guys know, that if it's right at the insertion, just don't. That won't get better very quickly. It takes a long time. Even if they're doing everything right, even if they're doing everything right, um, you've got to get them prepared for a fairly long recovery. Because if there's no blood flow, the collagen can't heal, and you can't lay down more matrix. To then feel feel great again, it can take a long. I, how long was I wearing elbow freaking sleeves or at ultra? God damn, it was just so. But but you know you, you then work. Okay, why is it sore? Change my movement. Use my lats. Don't just pull on the on the with the shoulders and then. I can still train uh, but, and promote healing at the same time. But if I didn't change my movement, it'd never heal. Never. So it's common like with snatches and clean, that they're constantly... Yeah, exactly. Yep, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, I know, like, Pat yeah. Boom. Yeah. 
So I kept one mm. back, mm. like way less. Yeah. That they were just drilling. You've got to almost. You you feel like putting a bloody uh, a plank behind the elbow, so they've got to do that as opposed yeah. to. Yeah. And it is hard for guys too because they're not your normal gym where they've been doing athletic stuff and they've come into the gym to join your gym. Yeah. Our guys are coming in as patients. So they don't generally have athletic or coordinated backgrounds necessarily. And so going from you know hab where we're teaching basic movement proficiency to complex movements, you know, which is why we divide developed neuro move because there was a big risk with going into neuro fit and suddenly learning complex yeah. movements with no effort. Yeah. So do you, are you familiar with uh, slap pairs or meniscal injury? Do you know what the labrum is? Yeah, what well, was slap pairs? I don't know. Yeah, so that just that refers to the um, the the labrum, so labral tear, um, superior labral tear, AP means antero antero posterior. So this is the labrum. So a lot of our joints aren't like the hip, okay? Where whereby uh, there's a socket and then the bone comes into the socket. Well, the hip joint is, but but the shoulder joint. It's sort of like there's a bone here and there's a flat surface here. Good luck to you holding it in there, um, and and hence it's it's inherently a lot more unstable. The labrum is just like a lip that tries to create a bit of stability uh, to, to make a make a socket, but it's not a bony socket. It's a it's a connective tissue socket, and so uh, but even even the hip joint the hip joint has a small labrum as well. Uh, but label tears of the hip are much less common than label tears of the shoulder because it also has a bony, it's, it's, it's got a beautiful ball and socket thing uh, as opposed to we, we, we get lots of labral, you know, who was it the other day, had a labral injury, um, I can't remember, but yeah, that's your, that's your labral and meniscal injury, there's your meniscus there, the, the meniscus is just a, a, a thickened part of the cartilage of your joint. Just a thickening. They can, but they're, they're pretty. The 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 hip, the shoulder surgeons look at that as potentially a surgical, a surgical condition. Um, again, because they're really poorly vascularized. Yes, it takes a long time. Yeah. Don't want to rest that. Poorly vascularized. Yep. Terrible. Exactly. <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll stitch it up, <laughs> repair it, but then, you know, and this is where the failure happens is that they don't reverse what caused the label tear in the first yeah. place, so people just are still sore, still sore, yeah. really. Alright, so we'll move on a little bit to the nervous system. Um, the, we can divide the nervous system into uh, three broad categories, so we have the central nervous system, which is composed of, Joey? Brain. And? Spine. Spinal cord. Spinal cord, yep. And then the peripheral nervous system. And um, so that's everything else. <laughs> the, and then our autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system is, is just, um, you know, as the word, auto automatic. It, it, it's, happen it's just controlling all of our physiology without us even knowing it. Like, n none of us are aware that, oh, we have to breathe now, exhale, inhale. We don't have to think about making our heart beat. It just happens, and that's all aut aut automatic. Um, and the peripheral nervous system communicates with our central nervous system through receptors, okay? And relevant to us, uh, like there's millions of eye receptors, he hearing receptors, um, stretch receptors. Our whole body is lined with receptors and, and they each have a different sort of external stimulus to transfer to our brain so that we can process that and, and be human beings. But relevant to us is something called nociceptors and nociceptors have the job of transferring uh, unpleasant noxious stimuli to our brain. Okay, so if we pinch our skin, if we pull our hair, if we touch something hot, we are activating a nociceptor. Uh, and noci, I think, is Latin, uh, which means do, it does harm. And um, uh, this is the other element of pain uh, processing, which we'll talk about in a second. But central sensitization and then and, and pain physiology is fairly complex. But I think we've got a really good model for e educating patients about pain. Um, so the other ways that we can transfer these noxious or harmful uh, pain messages to the brain, one is our nociception, pinching, uh, neuropathic. So if we, 
if we uh, um, hurt a nerve, so a disc prolapse for example, pushing on a nerve, that's going to be sending a nasty message up our spinal cord, or through inflammatory mechanisms and say, say we're moving poorly and then we get um, uh, structural, structural changes that mechanical stress leads to biological inflammation leads to pain and then structural breakdown and the inflammation can happen uh, at various parts of our body not not just the disc or, or the or the facet joint but as we said before tendons bursitis enthesitis labrum they all they all are embedded with nociceptors uh, and this is how it, this is how it all happens the cross section of the spinal cord going from central nervous system to peripheral nervous system and there's just highways of information highways of information just coming into our brain all the time through through our through our nerve roots that are connected to our extremities and it's it's all it does follow a fairly nice map if you if you understand the map um, you can sort of make clinical predictions as to where the problems are so we've got these body maps called the dermatomal map um, so just say for instance if I tickled the L4 nerve I could expect the patient to be telling me that I'm getting some pain around here if I tickled the L5 nerve I'm going to be getting pain here if I tickled S1 I get pain here and so um, we can make some clinical uh, educated guesses but really the, these this science was developed hundreds of years ago um, uh, when we didn't have MRI scans so it, all, it almost becomes pointless to, to be skilled in this area but but we, we still have to learn it um, uh, because what I'm going to do is get an MRI scan it's going to tell me the L5 nerve root is pinched off so the cell that forms our heart was originally very close to the cells that will form our arm and so as we then turn into a human being that has an arm and has a brain when that cell that was part of that is become my heart cell gets hurt your brain still has some connection that that was part of the arm and hence when I when I get a heart attack it's very common for people to say that I've got arm pain okay and so the same the same thing can happen when we irritate a facet joint a tendon a muscle a disc uh, we can get referred pain as well how do you know what's referred and what's well, that's like this pain that I have in my leg is it referred pain or is it well that's why we have the yeah. the, the technology of the MRI yeah. okay, okay so, so you learn you yeah yeah so if I say say we did an MRI scan and, and it was absolutely perfect then we could uh, then we could say right we've, we've ruled out neuropathic pain okay. and so, yeah so yeah, yeah. There's so, the synapses what is it synapses or whatever where the, um, the messages from say when it jumps through to the L4 L5 which usually runs a certain path yeah that can be so big that it sets up other peripheral nerves as well or whatever there, there certainly is yeah there, yeah, yeah there's, there's, there is overlap you can have these overlapping neural um, dermatomes so really how referred pain happens or it can be referred pain don't think of new, referred pain as being through neural, um, neural messages okay, yeah. it's more it's more it's more embryonic embryonic origins because those like yeah, whatever is so close to whatever it may be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Up that yep, yep. Uh, message yep. instead of it being actually caused. Exactly. Yeah, I think you're getting that. Yeah, there's, there's, that's, that's sort of getting on the right track. Like appendicitis, um, the appendix lives down here. Yeah. When it's starting to get inflamed, we feel pain here. Yeah. Because the appendix used to be part of the small intestine. Okay. And so when, when with the, the small intestine gets hurt, we feel central pain. Yeah. So when the appendix gets inflamed, even though it's down here, uh, we'll tell our brain, because the, ner the nervous system that was part of that development thinks it's still part of the small intestine. Yeah. So it tells us that until certain things change in the appendix and it gets super inflamed, and then now you start to get irritation down here. So they talk about migrating pain, which is classic of appendicitis. Oh, I started here, but now it's here. Yeah. Appendicitis, 100%. Yeah. 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 
and and there's the um, there's the the sort of old way of thinking about pain. Just you know, you hurt something in the toe, it sends a message to the brain. But now we know that there's so much um, uh, other influences that that uh, modulate that pain. You know, just like uh, a soldier can have his leg blown off and, and he'll still be able to crawl his way to, to safety even though he's had his leg blown off because there's so much processing of that pain. You can, they might not even feel pain. I think Joe broke a finger uh, and, 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 and you didn't even feel pain in your finger because Harry was on the ground, uh, uh, you know, you, you stacked it on your bike and you didn't feel pain until you were... <laughs> not until the... <laughs> <laughs> And, was nice. and Joe, Joe stands up and she's got her finger. I said, Joe, I think you're going to gonna lose that, Joe. I, I think you didn't feel anything. I picked her up and I saw my pinky in the face. And that when I turned around, Dave goes, You're going to lose that. <laughs> Those words. Pain. Uh, yeah. Flooded in. You just flooded in. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I remember yeah. I broke my arm and it Good. literally was sagging down. I didn't realize yeah. until yeah. I climbed a fence. Yeah, well, yeah. Jesus. So I was like, Oh, oh were you like, hit the fence. Something? And it was down. I was just like, Whoa. Well, the 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 neural um messages will still be there. Mm -hmm. They'll be happening, but your brain is over overriding that. It's sort of like if you got bitten by a shark. Well, no, no, it's exactly, it's not painful. Yeah, it's just... It's not painful. Like yeah. Other communities, other things. things. It's be yeah, it's being yeah. modulated. It's being modulated, so, you know, if, if someone was, if a murderer was coming at you and trying to kill you and you had glass on the ground and you had no shoes on, you're going to run over that glass and for your life and it's not going to hurt. It's not going to hurt until you stop and you go, oh shit, my feet hurt, yeah. because your brain overpowers that pain because that's not it's protective. It's, 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 so that's also because it's um, like... Uh, but, the, but your nervous system would still be sending those signals back to you. It can't not because it's just a nociceptor. It can't not be, but it's just that your brain's modulating, over overriding that, that signal. Does that make sense? It's like when, uh, like the way I read it was when people get shark attacks or like when they're outside mm, mm. and they don't feel that pain because you, your mm. brain's saying like survival yeah yeah i understand that i'm just saying oh, is it actually painful it, yeah it no, you're not. You're not. You're not. You're not registering it as painful. Yeah. You're, but it, but the same, the same physiological processes are happening uh, when it does become painful. So, like when you're when you've been rescued from your shark attack, and you're on the boat. Now you now you look at your Jesus. That hurts. That was still happening beforehand whilst you were in the water. Yeah. Um, it's just that you were able to modulate over that. Pretty incredible. Yeah. 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 Okay. Drugs for inflammatory pain: Nurofen, Voltaren, Naproxen. Drugs for neuro, uh, neuropathic pain: Lyrica, Neurontin, Tegretol, Epilim. Drugs for nociceptive pain: Panadol, Codeine, Morphine, Tramadol. Drugs for central pain: Ketamine, Cannabis, Endet. Okay. So these are this is pretty. This is going to cover most things. But just remember that a patient who comes with neuropathic pain may also have some inflammatory uh, 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 origin of pain symptoms. They may have no susceptive origin of pain symptoms. They may have central origin. And so you can't just say you, you're just inflammatory, you're just neuropathic, you're just uh, no susceptive. Where's that piece of paper there? Hmm? We have that in the office. Yeah. Just what patients ask for. No, I just put that on the slide. We haven't, I've got, I've got it's that one. on the paper. It's, uh, is that what you're asking? Yeah. I've got that. Uh, I've got that piece of paper. That use Heaps. Yeah, um, Heaps. Do, yes. Rick. Oh, you don't know Rick. He uses he, it. CBD. Yeah, he's just right. trying to find a spot. Mm. Yeah. I'm just wondering, <laughs> like how it affects um, otherwise. Wheel and deal. Oh, there's yeah. 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 the other yeah. one that you want to talk It's probably safer than all of these. That, all of these. Yeah. 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 It's probably safer. I never tell people, I don't say get off your cannabis because it's illegal. I, I say if it's helping you, this is why. Is it illegal? Totally. At, at the moment, yeah. <laughs> totally. I know, it's it's like, like, no, no, there is medicinal cannabis, cannabis now. But oh, yeah, but that's, that's unregulated. You know, you, you, it's not it's not it's not the, the GP can now prescribe medicinal cannabis. Yeah. 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 Ye
Yeah, we can yeah, give cannabis. You can give cannabis for cancer pain and things like that, and you can oh, give it. Very tight. Very tight. Yeah, not for not for the run of the mill back pain. Wow. Yeah. Increase Yeah. It'll change. It'll change. On cannabis, have used the medication as well. Yeah, like yeah, but the, not many people are using ketamine. No. Uh, so we're probably one of the few practices that are really increasing our utilisation of ketamine because I, I'm getting better at, at understanding this component of all our patients, just having seen so many patients like this. Yeah. How does that work with someone like um, Damo, Damien, what's his name? Damo Lily. Damo Lily. prescribed him ketamine. Um, he's had two microdisectomies, not yeah. you, someone yeah. else. You've, we've booked him in to see you next week. Oh, okay. Yeah, because yeah. he is concerning. So mm. he said to me, I've stopped taking the ketamine. It helped me mentally, but it didn't help my pain. Mm. So what, yeah, I mean, what it, is that? It's, not, it's still not a, it's not a magic pill. But yeah, so so is, is that normal for it to help you? Like, how, what does he mean by that? I don't know if you know. I don't. I mean, look, there are there are um, uh, psychological side effects. Okay. We're not. We're not. We don't want those. Yeah, I know. So yeah. yeah so, but it is being prescribed as a pain medication, mm -hmm. not a uh, mood altering. Yeah. Yeah. It's but it, but that's a side effect. Like an antidepressant. Yeah, we don't want the mood altering effects, but that's okay. one of the side effects. So that's what he's experienced. Yeah, he might that, be. Yep. But not. Relief, so ketamine yeah. is used as a psych. Yeah. Psych. So it's an it's, it's also yeah. used as an antidepressant, yeah. which is valuable for us too. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, the dysphoric side effects are things that we don't want. Um, but you can take that. Is that special pain when they take it recreationally? Yeah. Yeah. It's abused. It is abused. Absolutely. What's a special pain? It's a drug of abuse. And this is <clears throat> this is what's happening in our brain when when we uh, get central pain. Okay. <laughs> We're getting activation of receptors that are not normally active and that's why these drugs don't work on central pain because it's a whole different class of receptors and, and um, neurotransmitters that are so doing the job. So we quite a few guys that have got central pain that their GPs and stuff put them on Lyrica mm. and that. So would we be suggesting to them to, because Lyrica is addictive, would we be suggesting to them that they don't need the Lyrica? Lyric is primarily for um, neuropathic pain, yeah. yeah. So, so if we clear them and they're central, they've got central pain and their GPs, yeah. No, yeah, I, I put that, I sometimes it's put that in my letter. Stuff. Yeah. 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 There you go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? So, so would you also oh, use the so you know, because when they like talk to us about the medication that they're on and stuff, mm. would it be right for our guys to suggest it? No. No, I just want you. I just want you guys to be educated about it. Yeah. I don't think we should. You know, I don't think we should be stepping in. Yeah. yeah. Those type of things you can just bring up with me if they, if they become significant. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what do you think? If this guy's in pain, so just a couple of images to look at. If this, there's a disc prolapse. Okay. Pushing on disc prolapse. Pushing on nerve. <clears throat> Here's your tear in the disc. Tear in the disc, nerve, nerve. Pretty happy. He's going to. He's in pain. What we we call that nociceptive pain. Here's another patient with a rotten L5S1 disc. He's got lots of back pain. We can call that inflammatory pain. Nerves are all happy. No problems there. So you can feel that inflammation. He'll still have nociceptive as well. Like there'll be nociceptive activation. No, sorry, can you go back to the nociceptive yeah. one? Why mm -hmm. is that? I want to see that again. That one? Could you explain that again? That one there, that one's, neuro, that one's neuropathic. Because there's, the, there's a prolapse. Yeah. See the prolapse there? Yeah. Big prolapse there. Nerve being pinched off. Yeah. See the nerve just draping down there? Yeah. Okay, so now he's getting neuropathic. He'll still have some nociceptive pain too because the, the disc has been stretched. So remember we said that no one really comes and you're only neuropathic yeah. because in order to get neuropathic pain, you had to inflame the disc and activate the nociceptors and now you've just gone another step and you're also layering on top of that neuropathic pain. So when you're explaining... This one here. Yeah, this so this guy's got a tear 
Okay, so he's at the he's just torn his disc annulus. Okay, but the nerve is still happy. Nerves are still happy, no prolapse, no contact. And so he's not going to really describe neuropathic pain. He'll describe no he'll describe back pain and maybe some referred pain, but not neuropathic pain. Because they don't have an eye for MRI, that one's hard for us to see. Yeah, yeah, because it's really hard knowing to what a normal understand. nerve looks like from that yep. position. Whereas with your one that was the neuropathic, yeah. you can see that yeah, you can see that rotten disc. Yeah. But he probably would have started off with a fair bit of that in the early days of his history and that they all say that you know i had back pain for years and then suddenly oh leg pain too yeah that's pretty typical inflammatory okay so there's me um david johnson <laughs> look at that this is in 2008 before i had any understanding of movement back pain commonly still being active still running swimming surfing tennis uh disc prolapse um and and then 2016 I think that is there's there's my spine there and it looks still looks a bit dicky I've got a I've got a fracture there that's my fractured bone there and, but because I'm so much more aware of movement proficiency um, even though my spine MRI doesn't look great I don't have to have any back pain if I move poorly I develop back pain and, and, I, and, I, and I continuously try to build my functional capacity so that on those, you know, accidental or, you know, unavoidable bad movements, it doesn't, it doesn't stir me up. So when I do burpees or when I do, uh, you know, roly-polies on the beach, which is, I'll, I'll be okay. Except you know? Bondi back. Bondi back, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, had, I was at Bondi, was scientific <laughs> meeting. Yeah, talking about back pain at the scientific <laughs> meeting. And the kids are on my back and I just go, I'll stand up. Oh my God. And I had to present. I had to present like this. It was so bad. It was so bad. Oh, so embarrassing. Um, that's what our disc looks like. Trust me. So he, you know, it's really made up of this jelly soft substance in the middle. That's, that's the pillow. Soft, uh, um, giving us that semi-rigid support structure, which we call the spine. Um, uh, and then around that soft pillow is this very tough fibrous capsule embedded embedded with nociceptors and the fibrous capsule is made up like this it's got crisscrossing strands they 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 crisscross this way and then this way and so that try that that construction pattern tries to give it the maximum stability uh, for axial rotation and that translation but what do you think happens to those what do you think happens to those strands so that's just a magnified disc and we've got strands like this okay They're, imagine them as being wires like like the story story bridge or something sydney harbour bridge that's a very stable mechanical construct but as we get older we do dehydrate okay so we're gonna we're gonna lose hydration in there that's 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 part of getting old. It's like wrinkles and grey hair. You can't avoid that, and it's normal. But what does that mean for our functional capacity? So now imagine the disc is looking like this. So now we've lost a little bit of height. So we just imagine that shrunk down, right? Which is normal. That doesn't mean you're destined to pain. Uh, let me get a red pen. So this is normal physiology. And then, but what is, what's going to happen to these really nice strut uh, cables? They're going to suddenly become a bit lax. Like so. Right? And all of a sudden, you've now got a disc that is susceptible to axial and translational instability. Simply because you got older. Okay? Simply because you got older. Now, that in itself does not mean that we should get pain and disability. What it means is that we need to maintain a high functional capacity. How? By continuing to understand and, and express movement proficiency and that'll be absolutely fine. You live to 100 with no back pain. Um, uh, but that is why we see, a st we do see a statistic in medicine that says as you get older um, uh, there's more back pain. But it's not because you're getting older, it's because you're not moving well. 
the substrate of tissue is greater as you get older because you've got heaps of discs on top of each other that have all collapsed as part of aging, all with this susceptibility with their translational axial instability, that if you don't move well, now you're going to have back pain. If I have someone who's got all of that and moves well, so hopefully myself, when I'm 80 and I've got multiple discs all on top of each other that are looking like this, but I keep moving well and I have a high functional capacity for an 80 year old and I stay within my boundaries, um, that'll be absolutely fine. So it's really quite simple, but yet the, the textbooks will say you got back pain because you're older. It's incorrect. You've got back pain because you've moved poorly. That means that everybody who is older should have back pain. Exactly right. Mm. Yeah, and also everyone who's young should not have back pain, <laughs> which is is obviously not true. And there's our nociceptors. There's an infra, infra diagrammatic representation of the nociceptors embedded in the annulus when we get those annular tears. Hey, Dan, Kate has to go on a second. Yeah, but I'm actually really interested. Yeah, that's right. Well, is there anything I'm really sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to move into surgery uh, and show you some pickies uh, about surgery. Um, so why do we do surgery? Kate, why do we do surgery? Why do I do surgery? Uh, to give you a new lease on life. <laughs> no, if your structure is compromised. So okay, yeah, you, yeah, exactly. Etc. Yep. Um, so you've had surgery and you had to have that surgery because it was a movement obstructing barrier. Yes. Without removing that structural deficit that occurred as a result of you breaking all the rules, um, mainly, mainly in terms of going beyond your boundaries, um, you, you then had an MOB. And so I'm not really a spine surgeon. I'm an MOB surgeon. That's how I refer to myself. I'm a mob surgeon. So I, my job is to remove structural MOBs. Okay, because, because surgery is only a structural repair. It has, does zero for function. The patient's asleep. The patient's asleep under anaesthetic. I'm not improving their, their function in any way. Because remember we said at the beginning, the definition of a functional therapy was upskilling the patient. And so you cannot upskill a patient while they're under anaesthetic. Uh, and, it's a, and, and surgery can only ever be a structural repair. But yet people think that, um, that surgery is the cure to their problem. It's a big mistake. Risks versus benefits, we're always weighing up uh, risks versus benefits. So there's a lot of people with, with structural things that, that I think, oh geez, I'd love, to, I'd love to structurally optimize that so that they can move better. But I've also got to weigh up, you know, they're 75, they've got diabetes, they've, got a heart, you know, they've had a heart attack, um, they're on these drugs. And, and so you're constantly weighing up the risks and benefits of your intervention. You can't just sort of blanket say, oh, you should have surgery. Um, and, uh, and, and, and really, surgery boils down to, in, on the spine, boils down to two things. Um, am I decompressing a nerve or am I stabilizing a joint? Or am I doing both? So quite often we're going to do both. We're going to decompress and stabilize. And that's, these would be, um, uh, Courtney, would, would that be a stabilization procedure? I think you saw one the other day. No, that's a decompression. Decompression. What about this one? Yeah, no stability imparted, or in fact, I'm making them more unstable. Fusion, Stabilize. stabilization, disc replacement, Stabilize. stabilize. Sacroiliac joint fusion, stabilize. Yeah. So, I would probably say it's slightly in favour of decompression in terms of the operations that we do. More decompression than stabilization. Mm. Much stabilization, like last resort. No, it might be. It might be the first. It depends on. Depends on. Yeah. It depends on what they need exactly. Okay. Um, and so this is how we do a discectomy. Uh, we do it under a microscope incision. Bring the microscope in, dissect our way down, um, down to the, to the um, nerve, identify the nerve, uh, sweep it out the way, and then uh, excise the prolapsing element. Okay. This is how we do a laminectomy, slightly bigger incision. Um, often we don't have to use a microscope because the incision is bigger, uh, but the same principles are that we're trying to decompress the neural structures which run down the middle, down the middle of the spine. What do you mean by sweep it out of the way? Oh, so, see, see, see how um, yeah. the, the nerve is draped over? It's draped over the prolapse, 
I mean, it has to be in contact with the planet, so otherwise it wouldn't be irritated. So it, it's, it, it, just imagine a tennis ball in your armpit. That's the nerve, and there's the, there's the prolapse, the tennis ball. So I've got to get the nerve out of the way to expose the prolapse. And then once I've exposed the prolapse, I can, I can remove it. And then the nerve's nice and happy again. If, if the prolapse is extremely large, um, uh, that process of squeezing that nerve, getting it out of the way, it can inflict a little bit of inflammation in the nerve. And, and so one of the things I have to tell patients is that I may make your nerve pain worse. Okay, hopefully, it will be, hopefully it will be temporary, but it could be permanent. Okay, so that's one of the risks of surgery, about you know, 1% that they may say, shit, baby, my leg's weaker than it was before, thanks very much. Uh, well, you know, sorry about that. <laughs> but yeah, it is a risk. Um, okay, so laminectomy, fusion. So now when we're doing fusions, we're not just decompressing, uh, we're actually trying to change the biomechanics in a, in a, in a more stable way. Um, the 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 joint of the joint so it might be at one level two levels multiple levels and we do that with uh, prostheses so we're going to put bolts and rods into the spine in contrast to this where we're actually making it more unstable okay and hence why it's so important to um, to get them to regain that that stability uh, and we want to be able to do our surgery from all directions, from the front, from the side, from the back. So you, you know, you'll see different operations being done. This is an X-lift procedure, which we call extreme lateral interbody fusion. So we're coming from the flank. Most of the time we come from the back, and occasionally we come from the front. Why? Why? Extreme. X. I think it was taken. Um, so here's an anterior procedure. Okay, so we make an incision on the belly and then we d dissect our way down to the front of the spine. This is the problem with coming from the belly and why I generally steer away from coming from the belly is because we've got the aorta and the inferior vena cava there and, um, and they need to be swept out of the way in order to get access to the disc and that can be dangerous. Uh, it can be dangerous and, and life-threatening and you know remember... Why would you go from the front? Um, well, if the pathology is from the front, okay. if the pathology is at the front, then we would come from the front. Um, and then, likewise, when we do a neck operation, we're, remo we're removing the discs um, okay. or the bone. Okay. Um, and then, and then either, and then stabilising once we remove those structures with those pins. And that's what a disc looks like after surgery. So, I was going to just touch on uh, the thoracic outlet and the popliteal tab. Um, why do we do the TOS program and why do we do the popliteal artery program? Okay, Get out of here. It's, yeah. it's recording anyway. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Kate. Um, well, we're re reversing dysfunction. We're reversing the dysfunction uh, in the shoulder girdle and in the popliteal artery entrapment syndrome we're reversing the dysfunction that, that's active in that knee region okay, because that's where the dysfunction is causing structural changes that are then leading to the symptoms. Okay? And if you have a little bit of an understanding of what the anatomy is like um, in the, the neck you'll see where the dysfunction creates structural, structural problems because these nerves run down from our neck and they pass under the uh, clavicle and then under the coracoid process which is probably best visualized here so there's the coracoid process there's our clavicle and all of these neural structures have to get from here down here without being impinged and if we have dysfunction in this part of our body it's very easy for those structures to suddenly start becoming irritated inflamed and then our blood vessels have to come our blood vessels have to get out too from the heart and coming out under the clavicle over the first rib and then down our arm so you can have neurogenic neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome or vascular thoracic outlet syndrome vascular is that not, is that not, uh, is that a result of dysfunction or is that like you physically 
dysfunction with susceptibility. Okay, yeah. Yep. So yep. you've got some people are going to be more yep. susceptible. Absolutely. So, so, so I was like, can you be like born? Yeah, yeah. So, you can be born, stuff, can't you? so born an extra yeah. yeah. There is. So does that? Can you see the difference between this right hand side here and the left hand side here? This is a cervical rib or a um, uh, a thoracic rib. We shouldn't we shouldn't really have that tissue there that was meant to break down as a, as we developed as an embryo. Okay, so so ribs are part of our thoracic spine. Yeah. But when we were forming as a as a fetus, we did have a longer rib coming off our neck as well. Yeah. And you can see the remnant of it. You can see the, that's the remnant of it in most people. That little structure there is the leftover rib that we had in our neck. But in some people, it doesn't disappear. Yeah. And so, so there you go, and, 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 and it's sitting here. And so now this person has a susceptibility to, oops, oops so, yeah, so, and so, but, but, but now as we evolved into humans, yeah, we don't need them anymore. So, so but, Sometimes babies are born with webs, and and the the surgeon will just divide it. You do it when they're a baby, before they get you know their, uh, uh, nicknames and things like that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, I know they can't. So I'm still having their feet. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. web um, toes, web fingers. Can you give me an example of remover dysfunction from the shoulder? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like 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 oh, right. like <laughs> yeah. Some kind of uh, uh, Yeah, so. Did you with as well that um, it can be brought on by carrying school bags and stuff? Maybe they fell and, and whacked, like landed on their shoulder. Yeah, if they get fractures, yeah. Even Callus. Is there many people like when they started learning cleans and clean heavy like? The callus build up around that area as well. Yeah, yeah. If you ha if you've had injuries and you get these big overgrowths of, of bony uh, hyperostasis, yeah. that can create <laughs> like it's a fairly tight channel. Like if you look, if you look at the actual room that all these structures, there's not much room there. So it doesn't take much dysfunction to just put all of that stuff under tension, and and. Just think about how bloody Rich Froning stands and he's like this as his natural position. He's got heaps of room. Whereas you look at school kids today, mm. okay, yeah. they're buggered. And so, so it's very easy to become, and that's dysfunctional. So we need to train that dysfunction out of them uh, to, to yeah. alleviate the symptoms. Well, really round, like if that's their natural position, yeah. with, when they come through, yeah. or Terrible. when you get them to move at all, it's you, it's just like their neck is just poking it's out. Cute. Yeah. They just yeah. it's still, it looks weird. You can spot. Yeah. It. Even if you look at a gorilla, a gorilla is oh, even though God, they're yeah. forward, they're hinging. They're in a really strong athletic position. They have the most they're stable. Not, I love looking at gorillas. Yeah, they're not yeah. a yeah. strong yeah. Huh? I love yeah. gorillas. I'm like, yeah. yeah, you look at their shoulders. So and yeah. <laughs> they, they, start, they start their movement there. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Whereas we start our movement here. Chain activation. Yeah. And they're in a really Amazing. athletic position all the time. Like they, they spend their life in an athletic position. Even though it looks like, if you think about a gorilla, you think they'll occur over, but they're not. They're, they're in a really strong position. Big chest. Popliteal artery, just so we've got it, oh, everyone in the team's got a good understanding of popliteal. There it is, runs down there. This is called the popliteal fossa. It's a it's a diamond shaped structure made by the, the, the heads of the biceps and then the, the heads of the gastrocnemius. So therefore we get this diamond structure there, popliteal fossa, and the artery runs through that. And um, and you can get again anatomical variations that make you susceptible to popliteal artery syndrome. But often the dysfunction in our lower limb movement, particularly in that posterior kinetic chain, then uh, brings that susceptibility uh, or makes that susceptibility manifest. Okay, and that's what you know, Dr. Cohen has to do when he's doing a, a release, and it's not very pleasant. If we can fix that up by improving the dysfunction, then it, it prevents surgery. And also, um, if Toby does do the surgery and we fix the dysfunction up after the surgery, the patients are going to do better. So that's why he likes it, because it, it makes him look good. It makes him look good. We make, we make Mark Craig look good, we make Toby look good, we make me look good, which is the value of, of movement therapy. This is a tough one, pelvic tilt. Okay, so I think, was it the other day Brandon was doing Neurohab and um, you guys were doing a talk um, and Alice you were talking yeah. and we had the uh, we had the South African, yeah. we had the South African, 
Keegan, 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 and this was him. I was looking through my slides and I said, here's Keegan. And so I just walked around, and we don't really focus on posture very much, it's like posture is not, posture is a static thing, but we, we want people to, to, to try to think about getting into good positions, and this is something that we, I struggle with um, correcting. Uh, yeah, you can tell people, but they don't seem to, it doesn't seem to stick. I did always like Luke's analogy of the fishbowl. Yeah. Um, I think the fishbowls are a really good way yep. for people to picture yep. their pelvis position and yep. it's tilting backwards. Here's, I haven't yeah. used that for a while. We haven't talked about that in ages, why not? No, I, I, yeah. I said that before. Analogy, people yeah. can I said it the other day, and then I realised we hadn't even, like, introduce that. I think we yeah. stop talking less about the pelvis because it becomes one of those oh, like then you get yes. a lot of people like your know, Hannah Mayer, the doctor, they overcompensate and then yeah, they it's say really hard. You know, I'm in pain all the time and then they're like what are you doing? And they're like well I'm trying to they're like trying to mm, this weird shit. It's really squeezing their Lots of weird stuff going worse. on there. Exactly. So we kind of stopped. Yeah, there was a few that came through now that you mentioned it, yeah. yeah. You can open up a can of worms, but I think yeah. I think what we we just need to understand it and set in place a strategy that allows them to auto correct. Um, and uh, so we understand anterior tilt we understand posterior tilt and then we've with this this forward shifted pelvis which is you know as bad as both uh, and and it looks different when you see someone standing it looks different when you see someone squatting um, but really it, it's going to boil down to four four uh, biomechanical pulleys you're right you right, you've either got looseness or tension uh, in this zone here or this zone here okay so there's four directions of force and they're either weak forces or um, uh, restricted forces and uh, dysfunction in that creates the dysfunctional position and so just have a think about that is either lengthened, loose, or shortened, tight, in these muscles. Okay, so if we if we identify someone who's got dysfunctional pelvic positions, it, they may be born like that, and it may be anatomical. But if we can optimize it, then we have to say, okay, if you're if you're tight in this region, let's let's focus on these muscles as uh, as a target for strengthening. Um, and then we can correct the imbalance. Okay, and, and I think I put it out on the uh, the messenger the other day about at psoas, which I hadn't seen before. The psoas march, where you're lying on your back and you're just doing. Do you do? Have you done those before? And 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 if if someone was anteriorly tilted with tight psoas, that might help them. Or you know, if they just focus on that, maybe once a day for five minutes, even though that's what we call accessory work. Um, that might reduce the tightness there and hence allow them to automatically correct without you having to do much at all. Without us having to do much at all as movement there is because we just eliminate the tightness, we regain the stability and then suddenly the pelvis just automatically adopts better positions. And and I think that's probably the best we can do it's with pelvic tilt. Rather than fixating on talking about pelvis as well as giving them movements yeah. that... Yeah. Okay. I'll give them the analogy with the fishbowl, yeah. but the fishbowl is poorly positioned and then this is how you're going to correct it. <laughs> and you're going to say, okay, we're going to, are we going to create... Uh, the other one would be, say, they've got really quite weak ab obliques and abdominals and so therefore they're going to start to they lose that they, they lose that airbag support so their spine's going to tip forward or, or they're going to start doing this so now okay well you better do some you better do some crunches or some side planks or you know those type of things to try to reinstate the the poor strength associated with the um their abdominals that's a lot when they stand like you were just saying hmm. it's, it's a lot of times when people have previous knee injuries mm -hmm. And it's like they've lost the ability to fully extend yeah. with their hamstrings or whatever as well. Yeah, so they've got little... He can't straighten his knee and he constantly stands like you would. Be. Little MOBs, stands yeah. Stands like that. Yeah. Which just always puts pressure on yeah. his back as well. Yeah. And he's got the big belly, which I think might lead to it as well and I think yeah when you guys are standing around just just make a note like have a look at them get them to be aware of that position and try to correct make sure it. we are just when we do the day one body awareness mm. stuff talk about the, the fishbowl fish in that just briefly yeah. so actually you don't forget the fishbowl too because we did a Samson stretch in a fit class once and I said 
like everybody put one like onto your lunge position and now about that dory fall out the back and I forgot to mention the fishbowl and everyone just went is that what you call is that what you call number is that what you call dory <laughs> Well, we used to, we used to spend a lot more time talking about walking, and yes. we get them to practice walking around the room. That's when we would talk about it, and then we we're like, "That's just walk. fluff. Cut that out." Yeah, mm. I do yeah. still like telling them to lead from their back foot. Yeah, um, but that's like a one second thing. It's not really. That's in our. That's, that's in our manual. Yeah, mm -hmm. whenever I get the sheep dogs, that's it. Like, that's it. What, like what I talk about. Uh, yeah, I think it's yeah. good. I think it's good yeah. talking about the glue yeah. yeah. And they like it too. They, they're like, oh, this, yeah. This yeah, this you can feel it. Sense, yeah. And yeah. some of them, I can't feel any muscle there. That's because you, you know, it's so big. <laughs> yeah. 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 Looking through the rear foot. I think it's a really yeah. good thing because a lot of our guys kick out um, when they walk. They've developed, yeah, they're, they're, they're walking with their legs going forward rather mm. than pushing through their rear. So they've got like a. Like they're kind of little. Yeah, yeah. A lot of our guys. And so, if you think about, you've got a sure, carrot, sure. your farmer's carrot, and you're not yeah, activating your posterior shoulder. Yeah. Mm. What do you think, Sam? If someone said, "What do you mean by stability, mobility, and tightness?" How how would you describe that to someone? Have you got a definition in your mind of That's how you? What does they? What does stability mean? If we say a joint is stable, so we go, "Okay, get that stable, get that stable shoulder position." What what do you mean by that? Just like probably <laughs> coordination through a movement. Uh -huh. Yep. Any any uh, any um. Uh, I would say stable. There's not a lot of movement. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of movement. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. So there you go. So stable. That's yeah. that's a that's a refinement. Yep. Okay. That's a refinement. Um, uh, Courtney. I'd say activation of like the correct muscles around that joint. Mhm. Mm George, any, any? I would just say everything's doing its job. Yeah. Yeah. There's no if the, if you've got stability, then you've got all parts working equally to create the right function. Mm -hmm. So if your shoulders stable, then it means that you've got everything working in line to create mm -hmm. the movement. That's and then as they said, well, how does that differentiate from mobility then? Like if everything's moving correctly, like yeah. that. But and you would never say that stability and mobility are the same thing, right? Yeah, true. So I, I just just sort of thinking about these things because we always get, you know, as as movement therapists and clinicians, uh, we want to have very tight um, def definitions of of where to and consistent messages. Mm -hmm. So I, I boil stability down, and you, and you can add and refine to this if you if you think. Uh, it's it's valuable, but stability um, is the ability to resist force. That's how I define it. The ability to resist force or resist movement. So if I'm stable with a kettlebell above my head, I've got the ability to resist that force instead yeah. of. So the load's on top of me, and I want to resist it. Okay. If I'm doing a pull up, uh, so say I'm doing a push up, the load's forcing me back up there. Uh, I want to be able to resist that force going out, so I'm going to be in this position. So stability doesn't mean that we're going to be in the same position all the time. Yeah. If I'm on a rowing machine and I'm pulling the, the, the oar back towards me, before I go for that pull, my shoulder blades are retracted back. Yeah. Because the force of the rower is going to pull my shoulder blades that way, so I want to be able to resist that. So what do I do? I'm going to. Well, if I'm doing a deadlift, you know how we always say shoulders back. Boom. We do our deadlift. Retract your shoulders. Activate. So stability will your your joints and your bones and your musculoskeletal system will be in many different positions, and you'll still be stable. Yeah. Okay. If I'm hanging, active hangs, stable position, my shoulder blades pulling down because the force of the hang is pulling me up. So in that, if you think about your definition, then that stability means the system, whether that be your shoulder girdle, your hip girdle, or your spine, is the ability to resist force. And remember when I was talking about micro motion of the spine, the, the, the bones doing this, the same fundamental principle applies. Is that if I've got a stable spine, I've got the ability to resist those forces and therefore I can hold a hollow, hollow hold and I'm beautiful like a nice curve. There's no micro instability with bones sliding and translating on each other. So that's how I use the word stability. Um, mobility is the system's ability to be moved by force. Okay, so 
people who are mobile, hypermobile, forces can make them move wide ranges of motion. So entirely different concept to stability. And a lot of people will say, I can't do that because I'm not mobile. That's not true. They're not stable is why they can't get into those positions. So if I try to do if I try to do a single arm 20 kilo dumbbell overhead squat, which you guys can do really easily, I find it really hard because I'm not stable in that position. Not because I'm not mobile enough. I can promise you that if you put me under anesthetic, you could get my arm into that position perfectly easily. But when I'm awake and I'm trying to find that position, it's not an immobility problem, it's a stability problem. So I was saying exactly to Ruth yesterday, so overhead squat, she can do almost a perfect overhead squat with a broomstick and put eight kilos on her and she can't move that. Yeah, them. she's got, like so she's got the mobility, board. but she hasn't got the stability to add any kind of weight mm. to it. Um, and so that, she was a good yeah. example of that. Right. She's got it, you can see it in her broomstick, yeah. she moves perfectly yeah. well. And, and, and so yeah, th these are terms, these are words that we use all the time in our coaching and it, it's really important to just scientifically know what they mean. Mm -hmm. you know, it's going to mean a little bit different to when you're talking to the patient but as long as when you're confronted by a patient that says, what do you mean by stable? Okay? Uh, and now we can go back to the drawing board and fundamental. And then tightness is also just completely corrupted in, in the literature. Mm -hmm. Tightness, people are continuously trying to stretch themselves out of tightness. And, and tightness is neurological. It's, it's dysfunctional, maladaptive, central nervous system driven hypotonia. <laughs> but but it, from a fundamental point of view, that's what we then will say, we're tight. And, uh, and if we don't address that over many years, yes, I think we will get some secondary but fairly minimally significant structural shortening. So our joint capsule, our tendons, our ligaments, um, they will get tighter, structurally tighter, but only by millimetres, whereas this dysfunctional central nervous system hypotonia will shorten muscles dramatically. Um, where's my tendon hammer? Okay, so just cross your legs. <laughs> cross your legs like you like cross your legs like that. Yep. Okay, so just relax. Look at the white look at the whiteboard, close your eyes. There you go. There you got one there. So so what I've done then Oh, it just helps. Um cross the other leg. Cross the other leg. Yep, just relax. Just totally relax, totally relax, totally relax. Yeah, you're quite a-reflexic. Let's do Courtney. <laughs> so that's just, that's just a genetic thing. So let's, let's have a look at Courtney. Wow, what's wrong with all you guys? <laughs> there we go. It's like Sam. Dude. Yep. <laughs> but maybe you're not relaxed enough. And... <laughs> Did that one jump? That was it, yeah. Yeah, so, see, so Sam's got normal... <laughs> and so if you look at his muscles, George... Why so that, <laughs> that, that so that's you look you can my see his muscle muscles. contracting a good centimeter right that's hot I don't have any yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm really jolty I, I, I jump all over the place but um he's just gonna get a good wind up for you too <laughs> yeah what the heck yeah yeah but not not overly responsive Jay <laughs> that's right yeah. <laughs> I do. Doing. <laughs> yeah. So Joe's a little bit. Joe's a little bit more. Yeah. Um, so that's 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 hypertonia, right? So so by by changing the nervous system, I can make a muscle shorten one or two centimeters. Mm -hmm. And you imagine one or two centimeters of shortening around your your shoulder shoulder moving muscles. Uh, it's going to completely screw you up versus millimetres of shortening of tendons and joint capsules. So <laughs> you then gotta, you've then got to say, well, why, why, does, why do I have hypertonia? Hypertonia um, is a protective mechanism that the brain emits. So if your brain feels that a joint is unstable, what's it going to do? It's going to try to, yeah. it's going to, try to brace it. 
and the most effective way of bracing an unstable joint is to get these muscles so my brain will emit signals through my spinal and it'll, it'll make those muscles hypertonic so it'll make the, just the resting tone will be increased not you're not going to be jumping but just the resting tone through the same physiological mechanisms that i just that I, we just showed guys that get the back spasm when they go into a spasm and so physios and stuff will release the spasm yeah. because the underlying injury is still yeah. the same it's just going to reset yeah you can yeah and that's the one thing that they do is they go oh you're tight here they're right well they, they should be saying you're hypertonic here what I'll do is I'll release you, see you later, and the patient feels good very temporarily, but they've done nothing to eliminate the instability that created the hypotonia. Yeah. So next week the patient has to come back again and get another, another release. But they think it works. Yeah, and, and, and patients almost yeah. demand it. Patients, oh, you yeah. got, I come for a certain, you know, you, Courtney, you would have heard a lot of that where yeah, patients yeah, want to yeah. be released because I feel tight. Yeah, yeah. So so we're so. About muscle training, just some training. Well, I, I don't, like, if I, I, I feel a bit sore today from doing squat pyramid after the wad yesterday. That's dumb. I, I don't think, I wouldn't put that into the same category as tightness. I would, I would put that into an inflammation category. Mm -hmm. I've developed a bit of inflammation as a result of overstressing my sarcomeres. So my, my, my you know, those act, oh, no. actin and, my, actin and um, myosin filaments, I've just... I've just made them work so damn hard that now I've got a bit of inflammation and that's part of the that's Yeah, well that's that's part of the healing and strengthening yeah. physiology. Yeah. I don't think that's tightness though. That's not hypotonia. Mainly because we've had a lot of definitions of mobility and stability. Most people go, Oh, it's a mobility issue. Yeah. Because to me I think of exactly what you said, except I usually think of front squats, but can you put your hands above yep. with a broomstick or just hold them up and do it yep. like, yeah, yep. and then you put a barbell and then it's completely changed, so, it's a, so then it's a stability. So they have the mobility to get those things, yeah. but then... Not yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. But yep. people will go, oh, you're tight, you're tight shot. But also, depending yes. on their medical background, I was just going to mention, so Ruth is, a good, Ruth is a good example. Yes, she has got the mobility, but Ruth's also had a double mastectomy, so she must have had breast cancer previously. Um, and so she's also had some stuff removed yep. that is... So that will, that will be structural, that will be structural, yeah. this, this structural tightness. So I've told yeah, because you're going to have scar tissue and that's yeah. going to restrict yeah. your movement. So that's yeah. going to change her goals for the overhead squat. So I've told her that I don't want her to see the overhead squat as being strength development, but it's more stability development and yeah. it's more for her long-term health and long-term... Um, range of motion and stability yeah. rather than looking at this as a strength goal yeah. it's more but underlying that stability is your you're, you're creating strength with your stability yes when so you're tired to as opposed to her thinking i just want to get stronger same, she's yeah. not going to see the same yeah. outcomes of some of our other ones because she's actually got some structural um hurdles that she's not going to be able mm. to yeah and, and the only other last thing to add is remember that when you put a load onto someone that their biomechanics can change a little bit such that they may, you may find someone who has a heavier weight do an overhead squat better than a broomstick because just like when we do an air squat we'll tend to be more tilted, slightly less biomechanical advantage whereas when I've got 60 kilos here I'm more upright, better biomechanical um, uh, better biomechanics because the load changes the way that I can do the movement yeah. and, and the load actually helps me get a more upright position. So overhead squat may improve as load comes on because the biomechanics change yeah. with, with weight and lever arms. Andrew was one. He squats completely different overhead. Yeah. Air squat. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, because the load's up here, so it completely changes the centre of gravity of your of your body. Mm -hmm. And so you can sometimes get into better positions when you've got load on. Yeah. You know, like we always say that when... Like front Yeah. Exactly, exactly right, yeah. So all cool. Post-op neurohead, Corny, mainly for Corny. So, um... Oh, um Surgery creates an instant MOB, okay? Um, and, and how those MOBs expressed? Uh, pain, you know, the scalpel pain, side effects of medications, instant weakness um, because of inflammation, severe inflammation in the muscles. Um, uh, most of the time, most of the time it's temporary uh, due to the post-op surgical inflammation of muscles and nerves. 
permanent muscle or nerve damage may make the weakness um, a, a permanent problem. It may have been pre-existing or it may be post-surgical. And also remember we're altering the biomechanics of the joint. We might be fusing a joint, we might be realigning a joint. So we're going to introduce instantaneous MOBs that weren't there yesterday. Okay, so that's, you know, we're changing the whole biomechanics of this person's neck. Uh, so you can see how we have to retrain that. Here's one of our recent patients. Look, you know, look at that terrible alignment. And then we're changing the alignment through our surgery. And, but that's bloody painful. Like that is, <laughs> that is really painful. And so it's going it to take a... 10 days to get, uh, to get rid of that MOB of, of the surgical pain. And it took me about three days to get over it because you know, it, took, it was hard, it was hard work. <laughs> That's like all day. Yeah. yeah. And then we can change the, the alignment of the spine. We were talking about um, uh, scoliosis and things like that. This is degenerative scoliosis. And um, by putting our implants in, we're, see these are these implants in that have been put in through the flank. We're changing her from that position to that position. And, and we need to retrain her her muscles to move differently now. We see that in our program too with guys that are non-surgical that they complain of flank pain and they complain of because we're putting them into postures that mm. they would not normally put themselves into. Yep. They've been protecting themselves for so long. So we get like a smaller dose of it without surgery. So sometimes we're going to be putting in broomsticks and we, we talk about the broomstick but, it, but I'm going to, I may implant a broomstick so there's a little short broomstick that I'm implanting and there's a good reason for that is that we're trying to re-establish that neutral position it might be a short broomstick or it might be a long broomstick okay but we're still changing their anatomy um, manifestations of movement post-op so we're, we're going to see compensations that compensation that we see all the time um, maladaptations uh, positions, range of motion, speed is much, much slower. They can't tolerate more than five minutes at a time. The strength is obviously poor and they're a little bit dumb. They're, they're, they're cognitively clouded by their PCA, their morphine pumps. And so we can't do much on day one. Right? Is it crucial to not let them settle into those, those compensations and maladaptions? You're like trying to... Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like Absolutely. Really That's to get them to move away from exactly. Them yep. Because otherwise, they then leave home day two, and and they just go, oh, I'll just. This is how my body is starting to uh, move, and it, it can be very hard to break out of that. Sij. Um, remember that the sacroiliac joint is a is actually a hypermobile joint. Um, we th sort of think of it like, you know. There's not much going on here, but the SIJ does rotation, forward translation, up and down um, movement as well. So it's a, it's a very hypermobile joint, and, and therefore, by definition, mobile joints like the shoulder are susceptible to instability. Okay, so I think SIJ um, mediated, SIJ dysfunction mediated pain is very underreported. Um, because a lot of the times it'll be perceived as hip pain, it'll be as a hip origin, or it'll be perceived as a lumbar origin pain, but really it's the SIJ that is driving it. How you, how do we, it seems like really hard to manage. Super hard, yeah. super hard, yeah. Um, like pelvic stability, like single leg exercises, that kind of stuff. Yeah, we, we haven't really got a dedicated SIJ program, but um, what we're trying to do is if our patients do have SIJ contributors, everything that we do in Neurohab, so the squatting, the crab walks, you know, that, that development of glute medius, um, that development of, of neutral spine awareness, all of the Neurohab movement point will, will hopefully just automatically um, reverse the SIJ dysfunction. When we get failures, now you'll come to me and say, Dave, this guy's not improving at all. I will then... You know, hopefully I've sort of thought about that before they start in your app, just so that we've entertained the idea of SIJ. And then we'll start to go and do things like, um, you know, I'll, I'll often do these tests in, in my office during the consultations. If these tests come positive, I will, before I start in your 
do some investigations relating to sacral electron dysfunction and hopefully be able to screen that out before I before they start neurohab. Can SLIJ dysfunction come from fusion? Is that Yep. Yeah. Hundred percent. Now that motion, segment motions. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so if we go Nicola, is that our? She's a crossfitter. She's the one, yeah. She's, she's the blondie for crossfitter. Uh -huh. What about bloody, um, she's a bloody, uh, Isabel, uh, no, 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 Isabel, uh, no,
I think like the hamstrings can get better. Is yep. that correct? Yep, yep, yep. Like, is, is not right? well because you're you're trying to straddle him yeah. in a fairly hinged position anyway. So that's that's not going to that's not where the center of rotation is. Like if you look yeah. at bones, <laughs> if you look at bones out there, and you're hinging him here, yeah. the restriction is coming from here. Yeah. Um, uh, so not so much there. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's what it is. Just, I mean, a lot of us will do it, we'll do it with a curved back. We will, you know, you, you, you curve, so you say, you t say you're doing a toe touch, you, you curve your spine. But I, 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 we try to, try to minimise that, uh, or at least say, you know, when you're doing this, try to keep neutral positions, because we don't know whether that one person in the group is going to have micro instability and then oh Jesus you know that could happen um, uh, but generally like when we do it we also sort of, once you reach a certain level of regular movement proficiency and high functional capacity we can do a toe stretch and round our back like Sydney Harbour Bridge and we're okay um, does that sort of make sense because we're we're moving through that range of motion in a in a very controlled way, um, but uh, yeah, it's hard to know if a patient who's had surgery, who's just got into neurofit, yeah. and they go and do a toe touch drill uh, as a stretch down, whether uh, they might we might stir up a discannular tear, we might create a relapse, you know, and we don't want to do that. Yeah. That is one of the reasons we created the remove to to prevent problems where guys coming from neurohab mm -hmm. into more complex or more demanding like movements or something. and putting them at risk. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, he really struggles with that. Yeah, someone so, so I heard someone saying the other day that I, every time I do burpees I get a bad back. Yeah, I didn't say anything because it was right in the middle of a class, but I was thinking to myself, he, he hasn't got the functional capacity to do burpees yet. Well, you're doing squats and push-ups. Clinton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So he'd be better doing three squats and a push up. Yeah. For like Tyler. Yeah. Until he builds his capacity. Yeah, exactly. Does he get that with burpees? Like really pulls Does up he? really bad after okay. yeah. surgery. Yeah. yeah. We're inflaming him. We're inflaming him so when he gets into non neutral okay. positions. Like you try to do a burpee without rounding your back. It's almost impossible. You try to do a try to do a pistol without rounding your back. Yeah. Okay, it's almost impossible. So we should always have it as a go-to that anybody who for, who says anything about it hurting their back when they're in a burpee should just be in three squats and a push-up for a burpee. Yeah. Because then they're in control of the movement the whole time. Oh, well, it depends what the workout is. Yeah. yeah. Depending on, yeah, yeah. what I mean. Yes, 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 yeah. Uh, it depends uh, what stimulus we want yeah. on the burpee. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, I think. Also, well, he wants to get back to running. I mean, I'm talking about Clinton. Yeah, right, yeah. But, um, it's just a mm. specific. Like, Little like, things that he wants to get back he into. He wants to get back to running, but he can't do a burpee. Yeah. So you, you've got to think in your mind, okay, Clinton, when he asks you that, is Clinton within the boundaries? Yeah. Does he have a small plot of land or has he got an acreage? And where does running fall in his, in his acreage? Or, or his, like, is running outside the boundary line or inside the boundary line? So you should say to him, well, Clinton, I, I, don't, I think running's outside your functional uh, capacity. Uh, so we need to broaden before you go back to running yeah. and I yeah so I that's exactly yet, but he's like right. how do I go about getting to that yep that's so we got to grow we got to grow his um yeah. grow yeah. his yeah. boundary um, he only comes twice maybe three times a week so yeah he can come more I think he's not that's it and and if he comes more yeah. and stays with the 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 area that he's, he's going to enlarge and, and then okay now you can go running if he's doing a burpee and, it's, and he's still fragile enough like if his capacity is low enough that it's going to hurt him doing a burpee he's not ready for the impact of running oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the bottom line is that it's a what you guys are doing is highly skillful you know so um, in, in, in admiration for what you do you've got to be on all the time in, you know, just in terms of your professionalism uh, and patients who are really um, high maintenance, they, they suck the life out of you. And you've also got to be astute for things like that, where they go, oh, should I go running? And if you say the wrong thing, and you, 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 can, you can 
they, you can then be blamed. Oh, but Alice said I could go back to running and I went for one jog and I'm sore again. And they completely lose faith in you. Um, you get someone doing a pull-up, yeah, you can do pull-ups, and they get tendonitis, and they completely lose faith in you. So we, ha we, we have a tough job, but as long as we stick to fundamental principles, we can, we can help most, we can just help and most And they be scared of their boundaries. Mm. You know, yeah. people like Jordan, they need boundaries because they will always push beyond them. Yeah. And then they end up with him, which is exactly what's happening with him. He gets one after the other because he's, he's practicing out of his scope of ability. Mm -hmm. He's going, he's, in his, he's out of his acreage yep. because he wants to be the same as everybody or he wants to be doing it to its fullest, but he's not ready. Um, and don't be afraid to set boundaries. Simon Spencer. Oh, that happened the other day. Yeah, Simon Spencer, yeah. So he, his um, classic is that. And okay, and so he, he uh, was doing, he was in your move on Friday and um, I can't you know, there's lots of stuff going on. Anyway, so I was doing push-ups and I was like, they were terrible. And I was like, Simon, quality, not quantity. Let's move up back over to the box. But unfortunately, I caught him too late. And he, uh, after class, we had to sit on a box for about five minutes. He couldn't yeah. stand up because he had no strength or he couldn't put any weight on his leg. Yeah. Um, so I've told him to email us and keep in contact over the weekend. Told him to email you because you'll be able to see yeah, it if it comes through. So he hopefully so he's okay. But he is crucial to pulling back and putting down yeah. injuries. I yeah. talked to Amy about on the way home because I yeah. thought of it. Yeah. Because he he was classic for that when it was just neurofit. He's been yeah. pretty good for a long time. Yeah. But he would After always and he's not the greatest mover. I think the last time he did it was when we were doing deadlifts. Mm. And he just like we've got quite a few like testosterone that. got going, yeah. ego yeah. got so going, and then and what sort of pain does he get? Back pain or yeah, back pain flares up. Mike Simon can't sleep in a bed every single night. He mm. sleeps on the floor, and he thinks things are improving because he's got a sheepskin rug on the floor now. But he literally he can't, he can't sleep in yeah, a bed. Mm. A lot of his movements are on back. Well, the, the bed, he's probably got a dodgy bed, but the floor provides him greater support. That's, that's why they do I that. Bet his life before. It's not very... Yeah. I wanted stone bed. But yeah. That's yeah. Ours, is. Ours, is, ours is called Stonehenge. I, 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 that's, remember we went shopping? Yeah. I, yeah. The, the guys would show me beds like that. It took me a little while to get used to it, but, but now any, anything else is uncomfortable. That's the biggest thing with Brett. If he comes in in the morning, then he's really sore. Yeah. Because he's like, they have a memory foam mattress. Oh, yeah. Oh. The worst. And he cannot handle it. Worst. But she refuses to get a different mattress yeah. or whatever. Because he said when he went to Asia, he never woke up with back pain. Mm. So that's how he gets back pain. Well, the problem is you go into a bed shop and you say, I've got a sore back. What they bed should I get? They go to the soft. Always be the yeah. cushion top, yeah. soft, chiropractic yeah. approved bed. Yeah. And they're so cushioned. And they that's, a good in, that's a good infographic for the page. Okay. Let's put that on there. There's going to be lots of people with soft beds. Soft beds. Yeah, yeah like, there is. It and comes up a lot. And that's what he yeah. said. And who wants to be the model? When they can't sleep in their bed. They'll um, go to the floor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Okay, good infographic. Give me ideas. Give me ideas for Facebook yeah. infographics. Need more? Was that help? Yeah. I mean, you guys know you guys know so much already, but it's really just um, just sharpening sharpening up a few basic basic things. That was really good for me because that's like what I find difficult. Cool. cool. Like yeah, you. Um, explaining things more kind of clinically, clinically yeah. I yeah. Find so explain from explain things from first principles. Mm. It's like when I teach the kids maths and, and teach Charlie fractions or, or algebra. You, you learn it from first principles, and then you understand the first principles. Then you can do the really complex stuff. And that's the difference between learning the talks off the heart and understanding the talks to a mm. point that you can just talk about it. If you learn the talks off by heart, but you don't have an understanding of concepts like stability and that sort of stuff, then it only takes one question from a patient to throw you off because you've learned it by rote learning rather than by understanding the concept. It's better to have a totally different talk to the person next year, yeah. better understanding of the concept. So you're saying the same stuff just in your own way. Um, and that way it doesn't matter what the patient throws at you, generally you're gonna be able to understand it. And if you don't understand something, it's all right to say, I'll have a chat to Dr. Johnson about that and I'll get back to you. Don't ever feel like we have to know everything clinically either. Um, don't ever be afraid to say, 
um, I'll find out. I'll double check on that and I'll get back to you um, next class. Hmm. Or I'll send you an email yeah. through after I speak to Dr. Johnson. Also it helps to explain it when people don't get the analogies you might be using that everyone else does, things like mm. that. Like I've seen that. It's the same as coaching, different cues work. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. same thing right. with education. Yeah. Yeah. Analogies are essential. And have your favourite analogies uh, just to that, are, that, are, that you know how to spit out really well because your analogy will be different to yours and mine will be different but if you've got one that you've used a lot and it's got the message across then um, then you're going to deliver that one the best uh, and yeah you see you see the value in other people's analogies to, um, and when you when you create good analogies that really means that you're you're understanding the first principles if you can't create a good analogy to teach someone who's non-medical uh, or biomechanical, then um, then uh, it means that you're not really understanding it fully yourself. Um, but yeah. I did the similar thing. What you got me to do that with cues and corrections, it's like three words or whatever. So you cue someone. I did that with analogies, but in terms of questions, I have two or three that I like think of and try and use them, so if they don't understand one, we've got another one, but instead of it being three words, it's like uh, an analogy um, sort of thing, yeah. I used to mock days analogies because they had an analogy for and it was like almost every day was a new analogy, but then now after sort of working in it and imagining him in a clinic every day with 15 people coming through mm. having to explain mm. things differently to each individual oh God, it's, it's and terrible. see why analogies yeah. work and yeah. how they get created. Yeah, I noticed that when you talk. Yeah. You got it. Like, they, they, they might be an engineer, they might be a... Picture in the head like it's a... Yep. Yeah. Finding the right one for that. Also getting engagement, which is yeah. crucial to then getting more um, yeah. compliance. Yeah. Because not everyone gets cutting the stuff. Not everyone is sort yeah. of that way in mind. It's just like some people aren't mathematically minded, some people yeah. don't make connections to clinical, and you have to have a, another way of... Yeah, we should make an analogy book, <laughs> just like a, like a photo album <laughs> of all of our different analogies that we can just go back to. Yeah, the only bad thing is you could easily write write it and then understand. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only bad one. And that's your whole talk is just one. <laughs> it's a pi it's picture time, guys. <laughs> like, um, for Court and Alice as well, just because you guys are yet to sort of take lots of talks by yourselves. Like, I don't know why it's sort of taken this long to figured this out, I guess mainly for Kate and myself, but Sam can talk and write on the board and stay with what the content, whereas Kate and myself find it very hard to write on the board and then get, talk, get the message out or remember where you like to lose, keep the flow. Yeah. So it's just now I either put stuff up on the board already, even if it's just like a, you know, a quadrant or a seesaw or anything that needs to be used, but then I can. Is that visual reference? Just refer visual, to that. I can have that visual, I can still talk and then keep going. Whereas if I stop, draw something on the board, then I've lost my train of thought yeah. about what I'm trying to put yeah. across. So I'm finding your own ways. Yeah. There's no rules about no. that. You don't ah. have to yeah, um, write as you go. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. I think I started off that way. Well. They, they, um, the patients actually say that that's a huge part of the program that they like, the education sessions. Oh, yeah. um, maybe bring them a bit closer. You know, when you've got them around the whiteboard, we try. Mm -hmm. bring them, hug them up a bit. Because yeah. like, sometimes the circles, sometimes the circles right back to the window. And I, like, can they really see the whiteboard see there? That <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Come forward, guys. Let's, let's get cosy here. Um, and that'll get your engagement. Like yeah. if they're too far away, that they, they, they might. Honestly, not. every group's different. Yeah. Some groups super easy to get them in close. Yeah. Order, and it depends on the personality. So if you have one or two people that are willing to step forward and engage, yes. Everybody else will follow. Sometimes yep. we have groups where you just have nobody who's willing to. Yeah, right. Step you have to up nominate people until or... week seven, and then you finally crack them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's fun. It's, it's great fun. No, uh, fun. Just... Yeah. Yeah. Guys or yeah, so he was we could get them to shut up on Wednesday. They're literally um, like, they to, to the worst, like, yeah, I didn't like how it flowed because they were talking too much. Too much, into, in, not yeah, focused just, enough. Yeah, yeah. 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 Just, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. 
focus. If you think of anything else, um, yeah, just let us know. We'll, you know. It doesn't have to be a, a formal big education session, but there's lots of ways of answering idiosyncratic questions. You used to talk a lot about like micro trauma. Mm -hmm. Micro trauma, we talk about that, or micro instability. Yeah, that's so the same. Micro instability leads to micro trauma, basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's nice, yeah. You haven't sort of used that terminology okay. for a while, but. Yeah. And then, so, that's the way I think, of, like, that's the way a strong man can pick up a like, heavy stone and he looks like he's rounded back because he's got that True. good stability yep. and capacity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, when we, when we were talking to a lot of the. You know, when we we're trying to get people to, I think that's why we got quite into the Twitter discussions because we wanted to people to test our fundamentals, yeah. and and a lot of the people that were testing our fundamentals were, yeah. and you know well, what? They would also throw things on there like the guy holding the bench. Yes, exactly. Position and say, look, see, neutral spine, so um, round back, so dangerous. Yeah. He looks fine. Yeah. But they're bracing enough. They're, they're, they're not realising. Yeah. And that's, what, that's how the wars that. That's, that, uh, that, But it was good. It's exactly the same as low carb. It's, yes. Yeah. Mm. And, and lenience with a chronic pain patient versus an athlete. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the carb stuff is the same as your smoking. Mm. It's, the, it's the hard thing to pinpoint because it takes years of inflammation and years to, of, to cause that's damage. Evolve, that's, yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah, but it's not like an immediate... You know, there are some things that you can just look at immediately mm -hmm. and go, that's dangerous to you, so you shouldn't do it. You know, you don't stab someone because yeah. you're going to hurt them. But you can eat carbs for years without any noticeable changes, yeah. so therefore it must be okay. Yeah. So, I was, so many misinterpretations. I about it with um, ACL injuries and, like, ankle injuries and stuff. I think there was one, the main one was David Beckham, mm -hmm. when he, like, blew out his ankle or whatever in a, in a World Cup game. And they just repetitively showed when it happened. Mm -hmm. But then a couple of people go, no, no, no what about the, the legacy? The legacy behind that. Adapted it. over the years. Totally. Which is yeah. built on that micro yep. trauma, and then eventually. Oh. Yep. Body. That's the that's the accumulative injury, yeah. and then the end, go to the smoking analogy. You know, it's not the first cigarette that gave you lung cancer. It's not the last cigarette that gave you lung cancer. It's all of those in between yeah. for the last twenty and years. Di and that's different. For they used to recommend People smoking. Did. They used to say it was good yeah. for your throat. Yeah. Mm. Good for your lungs. Lung capacity, wasn't it? Good for your lungs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah calm down the uh, larynx. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Do take the 